Today, I'm going to be talking about family planning and the options that are available to people who are affected by HD and who are thinking about having children. Uh, so I wanted to start by quickly introducing myself. Some of you, yep, some of you will have heard, some of you I might have met before um, in, the, in the last couple of sessions or over the last few days, but uh, I'm a HDO board member I'm a neuropsychologist by background. I specialise in Huntington's disease clinically and I work in HD research as a postdoctoral fellow. Now, with respect to this talk, I wanna make sure that you're aware of who I'm not. So I'm not a genetics counsellor and I'm also not a fertility specialist. So it's very important that when we're having these conversations that I'm going to try to give you a broad general overview of some of the options but because I'm not a specialist in any of these options, it's really important to get in touch with uh, the fertility, uh, fertility services and the genetics counsellors that might be available in your area. And if you're not sure who they are or where, where they are or how to find them, then get in touch with HDO and we'll help put you in touch with the people that you might need to speak with. Now, the other thing that I'm not is a mum, uh, and that's why we have the wonderful Angela Abel here with us. Hi. Uh, so Angela uh, comes from a HD family, and just last year she had a very healthy baby girl named Serena through IVF with prenatal genetic testing. And so we're going to uh, talk through some of the options that are available through IVF, and Angela is here to answer any personal questions that you might have. All right, so what are the options that are available to people who are thinking about having children? So the first one, of course, is to conceive naturally. And that means that if one parent has the HD gene or is at risk of HD, then the child has a 50% chance of inheritance. Our next option is prenatal genetic testing. And you might have heard of this as CBS, potentially. So in this kind of option, we're conceiving naturally and then we're testing for the HD gene in utero. We also have uh, egg and sperm embryo donation. So this is using uh, technology through IVF, in vitro fertilization, and we're using donated sperm or donated egg. And the reason we would have donated sperm or donated eggs uh, is because we would have the, the donation from someone who wasn't affected by HD. So we would eliminate the risk that way. The other option we have is IVF with pre-implementation genetic testing. And so in this option, we're still using IVF technologies, but we're testing for the HD gene when the baby is, or when the fetus or the embryo is um, in vitro. So that means in a dish. So we fertilize the egg uh, with sperm, and then we test that embryo for the HD gene. And we're gonna go through all of those options, those four in much more detail. So don't stress if you don't immediately know what they are, we're going to go through them, but I just wanted to highlight those four for now. We also have adoption and foster care, and I, I won't go into too much about the specifics of that. I think we're all probably familiar with what that would look like, that's, um, and that's going to differ significantly across regions. And the other option here is, of course, not to have children. And there's many, many reasons that a person might decide not to have children, and that can be HD-related or it can be for any other number of reasons. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is conceiving naturally and what that would look like. So I, most of you will be aware of um, how babies are made, so I won't go into the details of that, but essentially <laughs> this would be the fun, the fun way to make a child. Um, and in doing so, that, that uh, child would have a 50% uh, chance of inheriting the HD gene if one of the parents also had the HD gene. So this risk, uh, so if this person, if this uh, male here has the HD gene, then there's a 50% risk that his children may also have the gene. And then of the three children in um, blue here that are positive, then they also carry a risk of giving it to their children that they have. Now this risk is, uh, the risk of inheritance doesn't depend on whether the gene is inherited from a mother or a father. And the risk of inheritance doesn't depend on whether the baby is male or female. 
The risk is also uh, specific to each child. So uh, the genetic status of a sibling has no influence on the genetic status of another child that, that couple might have. So just to make sure we're all clear on how that, how that looks. And so conceiving naturally is, a, is an option that many people take up. Our next option is prenatal genetic testing. And the reason I bring this up next is because, again, in, in this, kind of, uh, this kind of setting, we've conceived the baby naturally. And if we think about uh, when people typically undergo genetic testing, it's usually in adulthood. So it's usually uh, when you're over the age of 18 and you've decided after much genetic counselling that you would like to understand your genetic status. So when we talk about prenatal genetic testing, what we're doing is the same test, but we're doing it in utero. So we're testing the fetus while the mother is still pregnant. So what does this look like? So again, we would conceive the child naturally and the child has a 50% chance of inheriting the HD gene. And then at about 12 weeks, so towards the end of the first trimester, the fetus would be tested in utero. If the, ba if the fetus is HD gene positive, then the parents have an option to decide what they'd like to do with that pregnancy. If the fetus is HD negative, then in most cases the pregnancy proceeds. Okay, so like all decisions that we make, this one has some considerations. So here, what we're talking about is testing a baby for the HD gene before they're born. And so one question is, once we have this information, what do we do with it? So many people will decide that if their fetus has the HD gene, that they would like to terminate the pregnancy, which is an option that's available. Uh, and I suppose I'll, I'll add here, so the, the issues we might face here are in terms of our access. And so I think access is one thing to be really mindful of when you're deciding on this. So when I talk about access, I'm talking about access to genetic testing. I'm also talking about access to abortion services. And we know that access to abortion services changes across regions and might be affected by legal reasons, economic reasons, religious reasons, and there might also be some social barriers. So it's important to be mindful of that. There is a small risk to the fetus in terms of an increased risk of miscarriage or um, increased risk of infection, but the absolute risk is still quite low. So there's an increased risk, but the absolute actual risk is, is still relatively low. Okay, so uh, let's, we'll move on to the, our next option. So now we're talking about egg and sperm or embryo donation. And so this is using IVF technologies. So we'll go through this slowly um, for those of you who aren't totally familiar with IVF. So IVF stands for in vitro fertilization. And I, when I go through the steps of IVF, I want you to keep in mind that there is a lot of paperwork, uh, a lot of fertility testing and a lot of appointments that you go through prior to this point. And Angela will be able to tell you about those firsthand. But once you're ready to start IVF, the first step is to promote a woman's ovaries to produce more than one egg. So typically per ovulation or per, per month, um, women will re release one egg uh, that mature, well, she'll release multiple eggs. One of them will mature and make its way down the fallopian tubes. So what we're doing in IVF is stimulating the ovaries with injections into the stomach so that the mother produces more eggs per ovulation. We then, uh, or she then undergoes a procedure to retrieve those eggs, which is usually under a general anaesthetic. And then in the meantime, sperms are donated, which if I may say is a much easier task. Um, so sperms are donated. Um, and then what happens is that the egg is then fertilized in vitro, and so in vitro is in a dish. So we um, fertilize the egg with the sperm in that little dish, and then that creates what we call an embryo. And those embryos are monitored for a few days to ensure they're stable and of suitable quality to survive the transfer process. And the transfer process is when we transfer that embryo into the mother. 
Now, in the case of egg or sperm or embryo donation, depending on who in the couple is at risk or gene positive, we can use donated sperms or donated eggs um, from an unaffected family member, a close friend or a relative. But you can also have anonymous sperms and eggs donated as well at the fertility clinic. So your options are broad around where you're going to get these eggs and sperms from. And then finally, we'll, um, once the uh, embryo has been transferred, you undergo a pregnancy test. Um, and as Angela tells me, that's often a blood test. Okay. So some considerations that you would want to be thinking about or that you might choose to think about. And that could be who you would ask to donate. So if you would like to... Uh, if you would like to have an egg or sperm donated by somebody you know rather than by an anonymous donor. Um, because of all of these sorts of um, considerations, people will often undergo genetic counselling before they have uh, IVF. Uh, and that's true of people that are having IVF for fertility reasons as well. Now, I don't want to um, dwell too much on IVF in the sense that um, it, you know, it's one of the options that are available, but it is a, a, it is a financial, there is a financial cost to IVF and that cost is going to differ significantly across regions. And I know we're all from very different places around the world in this room. So um, sometimes IVF is covered by the national healthcare system of the country that you live in and other times it's not, other times you need um, insurance. So making sure you're aware of the financial cost is, is really important. And IVF also takes quite a lot of time. So my little uh, figure sort of suggests it's quite this easy process and it's actually not, it takes quite a little while. Okay, so now we're going to talk about IVF with pre-implementation genetic testing. So um, you might have also heard of this referred to as IVF with PGD. Uh, and this is the same technology, but the terminology um, differs or has changed more recently. Okay, so what are we doing here? So. Uh, the first thing that will happen if we undergo this is, is a lot of fertility testing. And this helps the doctors understand the sperm and egg counts uh, and how likely it is that you are to fall pregnant. You then undergo a genetic workup and this is to highlight the HD gene in your DNA. So Angela can tell us all about how uh, her, both her, her and her father needed to donate DNA um, to be able to isolate the HD gene um, in any of the embryos that Angela, um, that were relevant for Angela. We then start the process of IVF, which is that sort of um, cycle that I had on the slide before. The embryo is then tested in vitro. So it's when it's in the little dish, that's when we test it. And then the embryo is transferred, if it's um, gene negative, um, into the mother. If none of the embryos are suitable for transfer, then we review the options. So either you might undergo another round of IVF or you might decide to look into different options. So just coming back to this figure, I just wanna highlight this is the point when we're talking about the embryo being tested. This is the point that we would be testing it for the HD gene. And here, again, looking at this figure, this is our timeline, helps us understand how it's related to adulthood. We're talking about testing here. So well before it's a baby, when it's just still a cell. Okay, so exactly what does this look like? So um, an egg and a sperm each have 23 chromosomes and they make a zygote with 46 chromosomes. Those 46 chromosomes are then copied and distributed as one as the cells divide, so um, an exact replica of the cell. And they keep dividing, so, and they are all identical. And so once we get to about five days post retrieval or five days post fertilization, um, one of those cells is then removed and that's what's tested. And in the meantime, the rest of that embryo continues to develop and only the gene negative embryos are transferred into the woman. So some considerations uh, to keep in mind, and with Angela's permission, she's let me share this with you. So this is an example of Angela's IVF um, experience. So she had two rounds of IVF before she fell pregnant. The first round, she had 20 eggs retrieved after stimulation of her ovaries. 
11 of those eggs matured, and then three were successfully fertilized with sperm. None of them were suitable for HD testing. They didn't survive. In round two, she had 25 eggs collected, 22 of them matured, 17 were fertilized, six then underwent testing for the HD gene, and she had three HD free embryos. And so one of those was transferred uh, into Angela, and I believe the other two were frozen. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Which is, a, which is a wonderful outcome, so very exciting. Okay, so again, some considerations. So I, I can't stress this enough. Access is going to differ across, um, across regions and across um, financial situations. And so I think it's really important that, you know, IVF and, and PGT, these technologies are incredible technologies, but they're not available to everybody. And so I don't want people to leave here feeling disheartened that if they can't access this, that's, that there is no other option. So there are economic barriers to these um, technologies. There are legal barriers depending on where you live. So there are some countries that are uh, that, that regulate IVF treatment quite a bit, and so it's important to be aware of some of the legal um, the legal access or issues that that might a legal barrier in in your country. Religious barriers, as well, um, it is emotionally, financially, and time intensive. So there's a lot of resources that go into having IVF, and as Angela can tell us, it, IVF is physically and psychologically challenging. So when we talk about stimulating the ovaries to produce more eggs, there's huge hormonal changes that we can expect to occur. Um, and that can be difficult for both the person experiencing those hormonal changes, as well as their family and friends and work colleagues. And um, so in general, it's something to be mindful of. There's lots of self comparison. So if you know someone who's going through IVF and you know they're successful, it, it's it promotes this sense of comparison. And so it's really important to keep in mind that your journey with this process is going to be unique to you and it's gonna be different to anyone else's experience. And this constant counting. So we saw before with Angela's numbers that these, num these eggs that you collect quite quickly drop. The number of, you know, when we collect eggs versus, the number of eggs collected versus the number of embryos suitable for transfer, um, are not the same, they're, they're different numbers. And so we can see that there's this real dropping and it's, it can be very difficult, I'm told, not to focus on, on, on those numbers. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware of this as well. So it is possible to have IVF without knowing your genetic status. And so this is relevant for IVF where you have donated egg, sperm or embryos. It's also relevant if you're having IVF with uh, pre-implementation genetic testing. There are regulatory differences across regions in terms of um, access to these things. And it might also, your, whether, you are, whether you know your genetic status or not may affect your healthcare funding through your national provider. So for example, um, if you have uh, a healthcare system that funds a certain number of cycles, they may only fund you if there is a known risk rather than uh, an at-risk sort of status. Um, so those things are important to keep in mind. But non-disclosure is something that you can um, proceed with and there are uh, people at this very conference that have experience with that. So. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, let me know and I can connect you to people that might be interested to, you might be interested to speak with. So I guess just some final life, uh, sorry, just some final considerations to keep in mind. Your life stage, so where you're at in terms of your relationships, where you're at in terms of your family, what other kinds of responsibilities you might have and how that might play into when is a good time, if there is ever a good time to have a baby. Um, it's something to just be mindful of. Your financial situation is obviously relevant. Babies made in any of the ways that we can make babies are very expensive, um, not to be underestimated. That's partly why I don't have one. Um, and I support- Trust me, they are. <laughs> 
support is really important. So it's really important to have family and friends that can support you, but it's also really important to be engaging with formal support services. Uh, and that speaks to genetic counsellors, it speaks to fertility specialists, as well as your general healthcare team. Um, really important to make sure that you have supports. And of course, as a psychologist, I'm going to plug mental health supports because I think they're really important. Um, so having mental health supports is, um, you know, I think fundamental for everybody, um, and particularly if you're going to go through something like this, um, which is likely to be a, you know, an emotionally intense thing to do. So with that, I'm going to finish up and take any questions that you might have, but um, particularly if anybody has any questions for Angela. Um, I can see that there's questions, which is great. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear from, from you guys and answer any questions you have. Oh, I'll pass it around. Yeah. <laughs> Just really quickly while Kelly is doing that, I have also my Instagram name on there. I do have both IVF and HD on there as well. And you can also learn a bit more about my story on that as well. The first question was about, you said you gave DNA, DNA and is that was yours and your father's? Correct. But what happens if, so say you're going through the process, but your person with Huntington's has passed away? So Can they get the DNA or what So I might actually um, answer that really quickly. It is actually a really great question. Um, so my mum was actually the person in my family who had Huntington's and she had actually passed away before we started the IVF process. Um, keeping in mind this might not be available in every country, but luckily where I am in Australia, they get my DNA, they get my dad's DNA. And by taking my dad's DNA out of mine, it leaves basically the genetic markers of my mum. So that really makes it a lot easier for them to then highlight the Huntington's gene. Um, if both of your parents were unavailable, they did say they can use um, potentially like an auntie of the Huntington side or a close family member. Um, even if you have blood stored, hair samples, they can actually use those as well, okay. saliva even now. So anything really that they can test their DNA with. Okay, and then the second question um, was, I, I thought that you know, when you go through the process and the baby's tested at 12 weeks, that if it was positive, you had to terminate. Is, that, is it not a definite? So it is different per country. Uh, you, I couldn't speak to the UK. I, I wouldn't speak to the UK because I, I, said, I don't live in the UK. Um, <laughs> So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, in Australia, it's not required. Um, Even though sometimes you do need to, if you wanted to continue with a pregnancy, sometimes they get you to actually present yourself in front of an ethics committee and you actually have to advocate for yourself why you should continue with that pregnancy. Well, as far as it goes, you can't force a woman to have a termination of pregnancy, so, so, so that's a given in the system. But in counselling somebody um, uh, and saying they want prenatal testing, and um, uh, you, we would talk about the fact that if they had the testing and it was uh, an adverse result and they continued the pregnancy, then you would know from the beginning that that child had the gene for Huntington's disease. Now, you can advise that. You can be quite strong in that advocacy. Um, genetic counselling is supposed to be non-directive, but anyway, you can be more directive there. Um, but you will, if you go into it, we have, uh, well, I say we, there have been papers published where uh, couples have done exactly that. They've, they've requested prenatal testing and then when it comes to it have been unable to go through with the termination of pregnancy, which is obviously not ideal. Kelly, I'm getting you to do your workout. <laughs> Someone should. Um, so I had two quick questions. One was just a follow-up on the question here. So what if there's no family at all to get the DNA from? Is there any way to still do this, or does that not work? 
You sometimes can, but it can be a little bit harder. So okay. in terms of that, it could be more financial costs out of pocket for you, uh, more time, um, but the big thing it would be is more paperwork. So if there is, um, you know, like family history with like, you know, the CAG repeats on like, you know, potentially a couple of family members, that can definitely help, uh, but it is a lot more difficult. Okay. Um, but the, like, si like the science of it, they can f figure out other than like the paperwork and the finances and stuff? So, I guess it probably depends on the region as well. Okay. Because only particular fertility clinics will be able to do that. So, I'll give you a quick example. Um, so, I'm in Brisbane, Australia, but my eggs were, at, well, my embryos were actually transferred down to Melbourne, Australia for the genetic testing because that was actually the only clinic in Australia that allows to do the genetic testing. So, it also comes down to excess. There's a whole range of different factors. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question, um, I don't know who would be able to answer, but I was just wondering, you talked about the risks with the natural birth and um, with the second one, I'm forgetting now, but what about with IVF? I don't think you mentioned the risks. Um, like, um, yeah, so what, with... Um, with testing the in the pregnancy, you said there was a risk of like infection or so what about with IVF? Because that's something I hear about a lot, that there's a lot of risks with IVF that a child could be unhealthy, they could have other complications. Like I, I don't I don't know really. So I was wondering um about that. That's okay, I can cover that. So pretty much with IVF, it has its own kind of risk, um, like without even the genetic testing. So for example, um, if you get overstimulated with the medicine, you can actually get OHSS, which is actually quite dangerous. Um, in rare circumstances, people have actually died from it just because there's too much medicine. Um, it can make you very sick in hospital. Um, so, you know, IVF has its own risk. Uh, in terms of IVF, it doesn't generally, like, affect the baby in any way. Um, you know, there's actually a myth going around by taking a cell out to do the genetic testing, you're actually harming the baby that way. They're missing a cell in the development of them, but that is completely false. Um, they are able to take a cell out because they've already grown so much to that point. So my question is a little bit related to risk, um, and I thought perhaps based on your background, I'm curious to know how much within this conversation for the community, we're talking about postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, you know, in a space in which you already have risks, um, and then you compound that with potentially HD. I'm just curious to know how the community is being counseled to be ready for that potentially. Oh, actually, quickly still speak on that. Sorry, Kelly. Um, so I'll be honest, um, I actually did get postpartum quite bad. Um, I have been in contact with my psych for many years, so of course she was really helpful with that. But it uh, did affect me worse. And, you know, to be honest, HD does sometimes come into effect with that as well. Um, you know, not having my mum here, not having my mum meet my daughter, like, you know, that also affects me in other ways as well. Um, you know, they are still connected. I can see my mum and her all the time, but, you know, there's there's certain things that you can control and there's certain things that you can't. Sorry, I wanted to comment on the reason for getting your father's sample. Um, <clears throat> Basically, it's, it's to do with the error rate. So within the laboratory, there's a phenomenon called allele dropout. So basically, you have two chromosome fours, and you're going to try and amplify a marker from both chromosome fours. Now, if you just look at the Huntington's gene itself, uh, if you get amplification of the normal copy, but not the Huntington's copy, you will make the wrong diagnosis. You, you'll have got it completely wrong. Um, so what's done is, the re part of the reason for, for getting the father's sample is you don't bother over much or even at all looking at the CAG repeat length. You look at markers above the CAG repeat length from both chromosome fours You've got a chromosome 4 from your father. You've got a chromosome 4 from your mother. You look at markers below the CAG repeat length 
and provided <coughs> when you do the test, you can see results from markers above and below, the chance that you've made an error is infinitesimally small. So <coughs> I would struggle <coughs> to think of a case where you, 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 you couldn't do that. I suspect the laboratory would say, no, we, 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 we can't do that. The, the risk of error is too high. I think also just touching on some of the mental health that we talked about, this is um, part of the reason we would recommend so, um, I guess, advocate for people to make sure that they are engaged with a mental health support service, whether that be a genetics counsellor, whether that be your own psychologist, whether that be uh, fertility specialists. But, yeah, I think being engaged before uh, pregnancy is really important in terms of that post-care uh, mental health. I just have a couple questions. Um, the first one, are there grants available for IVF um, with PGT from different Huntington's disease organizations? Yes, so again, it depends on which country, but the very common one that is known is um, QRHD. Uh, sorry, I am going to forget the name, um, but it is run in America. Um, Ali and her husband, Joe, run it, and they've also just recently had a little boy. Um, so they do have grants available, and they do actually have people who are both positive and at risk that they grant. Um, so I'm not quite sure, but I know that they have a really helpful website. Um, and in the US, I am aware. UK, I'm not quite sure, unfortunately. Um, in Australia, you don't really necessarily have an organisation, but there are grants that you can get, um, not just based on HD either, just based on even having a genetic condition. So there are some out there, but in all fairness, they are sometimes a little bit rare. Um, if you are looking into a grant though, my best recommendation is to get on the grant waiting list quite early because I have been advised they are quite a few years long. Okay, thank you. And then the last question, um, what is the statistic probability of failure with IVF? In terms of just general IVF or with? Of miscarriage. Like if you get implanted with this embryo, everything has worked out, but then suddenly you lose a baby. Um, is that more like, is that higher with IVF? Because I've heard horror stories. As far as I'm aware, I actually don't think it is higher. I think it's just the general chance um, because they've already done the testing prior to actually doing the transfer. Um, Honestly, I wouldn't actually be surprised if maybe in a way it could be lower because, um, for example, in Australia, when they do my genetic testing for HD, they also test for um, abnormal chromosomes as well. So, for example, um, I did have six sent for HD testing. Four actually came back HD free, but one of them had an abnormal chromosome. So only three were suitable for transfer. Um, so they do actually sometimes rule out abnormal chromosomes and sometimes there can be an abnormal chromosome that can cause a miscarriage. Um, so I know with IVF and PGD, you go through the whole process, you find out which embryos are negative and then they want to implant those. Do they know for sure, like, like they go through and they find the repeat and the number and they know the numbers of the positive ones and then they're just positive that there's never gonna be a mix up, like your negatives stay negative, like you're never gonna get implanted a negative you think and then 10 years later you find out that, oh, my baby's actually positive, like. So nothing is ever 100% unfortunately. Um, with PGT, I believe it is like 99.9 .9 or 99.8, it is like, you know, less than you know, only one or two in a hundred, like it is very low, but it is technically still there. Um, I personally never did it, but I have heard of people going through IVF and then doing the CVS testing afterwards, so the prenatal testing. And generally with both of those testings, like, you know, it, it is still, again, not a hundred percent, but people, some people might feel a little bit more comfortable that they've gone through both of the testing for it. 
Is there a maximum number of times that you can try uh, IVF without it taking, and then the doctors will just be like, we can't do it anymore, your body's not suitable for this, it's going to be a health risk? No. Oh, yes and no. So, um, for example, one thing that comes into account with IVF is women's age. So generally, you know, every woman has a biological clock. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, above 40, they do say, you know, obviously the number of your eggs that you have does decrease. So that is definitely something to take into account. Um, in terms of IVF, there is no like limit. Um, for example, I've connected with people on my Instagram page who have now gone through their 13th cycle of IVF. Um, for example, like they don't have any genetic conditions. They are just simply trying to have a baby. Um, Honestly, the number one thing I will say is it comes down to the financial burden of it. IVF is the probably biggest expense I've had in my life. Um, my two rounds and my transfer, all of my costs was bigger than my house deposit. So it was quite large. Um, you know, some people are fortunate enough to not have that financial burden. Different countries, you know, support IVF when for myself, it wasn't that case. Okay. And um, you have to pay for it each time, right? Correct, yes. Okay. And then my last question is, is there any research that shows like if um, a child it gets like most of its dominant genes from its mother or father, if it's more likely to develop Huntington's? Like if a child's a split image of their father with Huntington's, would they be more likely than the sibling? So, um I'm more than welcome to show little pictures of my baby girl. I'm happy to do that, of course. <laughs> um, so, for example, some people say, um, you know, my baby girl looks like me, but I can also see my husband and her too. So even though they took out my gene in the genetic testing, I can still clearly see myself and her in very many aspects. So, you know, if you take out a part of the gene, so like, you know, the HD part, it doesn't mean that that baby is not going to look like you. They are still 50% you. They just don't carry that HD gene. I think I was asking something different, and I think it was more directed towards you, of terms of not not IVF, just natural birth. Um, if you have a natural, if there's a mother and father, say the father has Huntington's, and the kids, the kid looks just like the mom, and the kid looks just like the father. Is the kid that looks just like the father more likely to de carry the gene? I'll come up to you. We'll wait. <laughs> right. Um, no, um, I guess is the answer to that. So um, um, there's many different genes that we inherit that um, contribute to our genetic makeup. Some of them cause the, the disease. Sorry. Some of them are linked to the disease that causes Huntington's disease. And some of them are what we look like. And they're different. So um, looking like your... Uh, father, if your dad carries the HD gene, doesn't change your risk of having inherited the HD gene.